Now that we've discussed the major sources of artifacts, let's spend a minute thinking about why they're actually a problem that needs to be solved. There are really two reasons. First, they add a lot of random variation to our data. If the EEG contains huge, crazy artifacts, you'll need to average together a lot more trials to get a stable, reliable ERP waveform. The second issue is that the artifacts may not be random, and they may cause a systematic confound. For example, subjects in an oddball experiment tend to blink when they see the rare oddball stimuli. Blinks give us a positive potential over frontal electrode sites, so if we have more blinks for the rare oddballs than for the frequent standards, this would give us a more positive blink-related voltage for the oddballs. We'd think we were seeing a difference in brain activity between the oddballs and the standards, but we'd actually be seeing a difference in blinking. Horizontal eye movements can produce major confounds in N2PC experiments. If the subject makes an eye movement toward a target on the left, the EOG will be negative over the right hemisphere, which is contralateral to the target. And if the target is on the right and the eyes rotate rightward, the EOG will be negative over the left hemisphere, which is again contralateral to the target. So moving the eyes toward the target produces a contralateral negativity, just like the N2PC. We have to be really careful to rule out these kinds of artifacts in studies looking at lateralized components like the N2PC, contralateral delay activity, and the lateralized readiness potential. So when you're reading an ERP paper, you should think about whether any of the apparent ERP effects might actually be non-neural confounds like blinks or eye movements. ERP researchers have three main methods to deal with artifacts. First, we can try to minimize the occurrence of the artifacts. For example, we might tell our subjects to blink only at certain times, like the inner trial interval or ITI. Or we might tell them to maintain their gaze on a central fixation point and then use an eye tracker to make sure they don't move their eyes. Second, we can throw out trials that contain large artifacts. For example, the trials highlighted in yellow here contain eye blinks, and we'd leave those trials out when we make our average ERP waveforms. This is called artifact rejection. Third, we can try to estimate the artifactual voltage and subtract it from the single trial EEG data. This is called artifact correction. This example shows a segment of EEG from multiple channels at the time of a blink. And here's what the corrected waveforms look like after we subtract out the blink-related activity. You can see the same EEG, but without the blink artifact. To estimate the voltage due to the blink in this example, I used a technique called independent component analysis, or ICA. It's the most common algorithm for artifact correction. Like most sophisticated mathematical techniques, ICA makes some idealized assumptions that don't quite match the real data. It worked quite well for blinks and fairly well for eye movements, but you should be cautious about studies that make heavy use of ICA for other kinds of artifacts. Felix used ICA to correct for blinks and eye movements in his aversive conditioning study. He also used artifact rejection to get rid of any large miscellaneous artifacts like EMG bursts and movement artifacts, but only a small percentage of trials were rejected. In studies that don't use correction and rely entirely on rejection, you'd see a lot more trials rejected. In my lab studies of neurotypical young adults, we typically reject 5-10% to of trials as a result of blinks and eye movements. In studies of older adults and people with psychiatric conditions, our average rejection rate would be something like 10-15%. to But studies with infants and small children often reject up to 50% of the trials. This isn't a problem as long as enough artifact-free trials remain to compute a clean, average ERP waveform.